Baptist, a guy I love, I won't mention his name, he tweeted out once they made the announcement that they're going to ha- allow people to dress down, here's what he said. This is how a denomination starts to slide into theological liberalism. Don't do it, dear SBC. And I just sit there and go, is that a hill you want to die on? Is that really something you want to go to battle about? Yeah, exactly. Maybe there's some guys out there that really want to feel the, the, the pain of hell, literally, on their bodies. Like the, the, the heat, the fire. I don't know. But I read that and I go, really? Is, we are here 2017 and we're still bickering about coats and ties? Now, if you wore a coat and tie here today, anyone wear a coat and tie? You're more than welcome to be here. But, you know, this is, this is how we roll right here, right? I remember so many people going, that pastor's wearing shorts. Like I'm this close to, to going to hell because I'm wearing shorts on a Sunday morning, right? I uh, officiated a wedding yesterday for a couple from Texas. They don't know me. I didn't know them, but they were coming out and they wanted to get married at the base of the Superstition Mountain. So 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm out there in a full suit. They didn't send me a memo saying business casual. She said, I want you in a suit. I said, all right. So I'm out there in 100 some odd degree. But the guy, the, the groom named Cutter, um, <laughs> we were getting to know each other. And uh, he was talking about how his dad had served in an elder at this church in Texas. And he had left the church because the church was so steeped in some of their traditions that they were really stifling the work of the spirit in their congregation. And this guy left the church And one of the things that was the deal breaker is that one of the other elders came up to him and said, your sons, when they shake our hands, they shake our hands too hard. Really? Is that is that what it's come down to is, you know, the way we dress or that or how hard our our handshakes are? You know, I grew up and believe it or not, I'm I'm a I'm a rebel at heart. Can I just put that out there? Like, you tell me not to do something, guess who's going to do it? That's me. And, and God's had to deal, deal with my rebel heart. Uh, he's had to deal with my, my obstinance. When I first met my wife, and uh, boy, God used her tremendously in my life. But, you know, she was part of a, a Baptist church, and, and I really loved this church. But the one thing I didn't love about the church were the people that were so stuck on their traditions that I would make it a point every Sunday to go, and my number one objective wasn't go, going to worship God. It was going to see if I can rile the old people up with the way I dressed. One time I walked in the service with no shoes on at all. I know. Sometimes I walked in there with a, with a, a do-rag on my head, you know? <laughs> a do-rag, you know, just like, look, and, I, and I'd walk right down the center aisle and sit right in the front, and I was just waiting for the gasp to arise you know why because there's one thing i don't like is that when there's people that are so bent on tradition that they suck the life out of something i want you to know this morning that there's nothing wrong with tradition the problem is when tradition turns into traditionalism you want to know the difference tradition is the living faith of those now dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those now living. Famous author said this, Tradition is a guide, not a jailer. We have a lot to learn from history. We have a lot to learn as followers of Christ from from church history and and tradition. The problem is when we begin to make minor things major and major things minor. We begin to lose sight of the big picture, the big objective. And all of us have fallen prey to that. Some of you have judged me because I wear shorts. Some of you have judged what we're doing because someone's playing drums. Some of you have judged because, oh my goodness, he didn't start with the reading of the word and we're not all standing for the reading of the word. Some of you have come into this place because of your tradition that is now preventing you from seeing what God is truly doing. In something living and organic, something fluid, 
We should not be so rule-bound or regulation-bound that we stifle the work of the Spirit. And so this morning we turn to Zechariah, and God wants to challenge his people's hearts. Why do we do what we do? What is our motivation for being here? What is our motivation for for saying we love God and, and we want Him in our lives? See, two years have passed between Zechariah 6 and Zechariah 7. So turn your Bibles there. And between those two chapters, write that down. Two years have passed. And chapter 7, we get the first message from Zechariah to the people because prior to this, the first six chapters have been visions. Eight visions, all communicating something different to the people of God. And what we have seen from the beginning are really portraits of Jesus. And we're going to spend five total weeks, we're in week three now, of looking at 15 pictures of Jesus from the prophet Zechariah. And today I want us to notice two pictures that are very good for me. I hope they're good for you. And that's number one, Jesus is the rebuking one. And number two, Jesus is the restoring one. I'm glad there's a God who rebukes me. I'm glad there's a God who steps into my life and says, why are you doing what you're doing, Scott Morgan? What is your motivation in this? And I have given him permission. Whether I heed it, that's another topic. But I have given him permission to speak to my life and to rebuke me where I need to be rebuked. Because if I understand the gospel, the lengths to which God has loved me, and saved me, and delivered me, and redeemed me, when I understand the amount of love and grace He's bestowed upon me, He has every right to speak to my life. Because if I'm in the driver's seat, I'm making poor choices. If I'm in control, my priorities are out of whack. And so I invite the rebuke of the Lord. But we don't leave it at the rebuke. Because as chapter 8 you're going to see is that God commits himself to us to restore us. To build us back up in ways we never thought imaginable. And so chapter 7 rebuke, chapter 8, the restoring work of God. It's amazing how God loves us. And the beauty of it is we are here together as as flawed people. We've made mistakes, and but there's a God out there, and you need to know this, who gives us second chances, who allows us to start again, who allows us to, to rise from the ashes. But you first have to let him get a hold of your heart and, and tear you down in order to build you up. He's got to strip away the veneer, the facades, the fakeness to really build up the people that are going to truly glorify him. And so chapter 7 of Zechariah, we see a picture of Jesus, the the rebuking one, and and it's a word we need to hear. It's a word that not not only do I want you to hear, I want you to really process and consider. Maybe you saw this picture on the internet this week. Um, It's really gotten quite the circulation. Uh, This guy mowing his lawn, his name is Theunis Wessels. Yeah, I don't even know where that came from, but that's cool. So uh, this picture was made famous because Theunis's wife and daughter were screaming at the top of their lungs at him to come inside because look what's in the background of him mowing the lawn there. A tornado. Here is impending danger. Here is disaster that may not be averted. And he just thought to ignore the warning signs and thought, you know, I'm just going to go about mowing my lawn. Someone pointed out a wise observation this morning. We do the same thing in the middle of the summer in Arizona, don't we? Yard work in 120 degree heat. Are you crazy? But there's impending danger around us. The question is, are we going to heed the voices to really do what's right. Luckily, the tornado passed by them. But what if it hadn't? What if he ignored the signs and disaster struck? 
Well, that would have been an interesting story for uh, the Hallmark Channel, wouldn't it? So, Zechariah chapter 7. Three things I want us to consider this morning that we're going to talk about. Three important questions. Number one, who are you serving? Number two, what are you pursuing? Who are you serving? What are you pursuing? And number three, who are you listening to? And I hope that these three questions that come out of the text will help us get a grasp on how God maybe is trying to get our attention. And if he's getting your attention, will you heed what he's saying? Zechariah chapter 7, verse 1. So we start with these words. Then it came about in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. The town of Bethel sent these two guys to seek the favor of the Lord. So Bethel, about 12 miles outside of Jerusalem, they are the delegation sent to Jerusalem where the temple is halfway through its rebuilding project. So these guys from Bethel come to Jerusalem, verse 3, speaking to the priests who belong to the house of the Lord, saying, shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done these many years? Now, this is an interesting question, and it's really a question about fasting. So these men are asking an important question. They've been doing fasting since the temple was destroyed, 70 plus years. They've been fasting four times a year for 70 years. Now that the temple is being rebuilt, they go to the priest and ask him, do we continue to fast? Now, I want you to know something a little bit about the background is that the fasting was never ordained to them by God. This was a self-imposed fasting. So God never dictated it for them to do. They took it upon themselves to fast. So now the question is, now that the temple's being rebuilt, do we continue in this religious exercise? Now, on the surface, it may look like eh, it's a fairly trivial question. But you have to understand the context because the real context is, well, you're fasting because the temple was destroyed. You're doing this religious activity, which on the surface may look great, but what's your motivation for doing what you're doing? Have you learned the lesson of why God destroyed the temple in the first place? Because why God destroyed the temple in the first place is because these were an obstinate people who closed their ears to God and God was disciplining them. These men are not coming asking the question, you know what, we've been broken, we've been humbled, we want to return to the ways of the Lord. They're not asking that question, they're asking the question is, do we continue in our religious exercise? Which is why verse 4 is so, so critical. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Now when God speaks, we should listen. Amen? Verse 5. Say to all the people of the land and to the priest, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months, these 70 years, was it actually for me that you fasted? What I love about God... Many things I love about God, but one of the big things for me, and you, you, we talk about a lot here in, as we gather, why we do what we do. See, God is not preoccupied with your religious activity. He's not sitting in heaven going, Woo, you went to church four times this week. What God is exhilarated about is a heart that's connected to his heart. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants your obedience. He doesn't want your busyness. He wants your passions and your desires and your yearnings. You see how in verse 5, God goes for the heart And this is why he has to ask us these difficult questions. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it really for me? Did not Jesus continually point people to the heart? Matthew 23 says, you guys make the outside of the cup look shiny and clean, but the inside of the cup is filthy. You're so busy focused on externals 
that you're missing out on the very thing that glorifies God, and that is a heart that is desperate and passionate for Him. Verse 6, And when you eat and you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Who are you doing this for? Are not these the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous, the cities around it and the Gev foothills were inhabited? See, God is saying, don't make the same mistakes again. Your forefathers suffered the consequences of thinking that the externals were all that it was about, but that's not what it's about. Learn from the past. Learn from their mistakes. Why do you do what you do? So the ultimate question is this. Who are you serving? Are you serving yourself? Are you serving those watching? Are you living your life so that people are like, wow, that guy, he's got it together. Look how, look how well he, he loves his wife and his kids and oh, they're going to church and he's driving the speed limit and he only had one beer tonight. Wow, amazing stuff. But the deep question is this. Who are you serving? Now, let me, let me ask a question that really affects us all right here, right now. Why are you here? Why are you here in this place at this time? I mean, I can think of some other things to do right now. I enjoy golf. How many people are work, wor- worshiping at the church of the golf course right now? How many people are, are doing their shopping because they go, there's a lot of people in church. I'm going to go get my shopping done now. Less crowds. My question to you is, why are you here right now? And some of you are going, well, that's a dumb question. Well, good, I'm full of dumb questions, but I think it's a good question, isn't it? Because why you're here is probably the most important question you can ask yourself. What motivated you to get out of bed this morning? Why did you come through those doors? Did you just come, you know what, the church is okay, but I came because the, the coffee bar is open. They serve great chai tea lattes. I'll sit and hear a little bit about Jesus, but I'll tell you what, that latte, spot on. Why are you here today? Now, you know me. I'm, I'm kind of a no-holds-barred kind of guy. Like, you know, I'm glad you're here. But the more important question is, why are you here? I, I picked up a book at a conference, pastor's conference. This is fun. When you get books at pastor's conferences, this is a small little book. You can probably read it in about 30 minutes. How to walk into church. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, this is an awesome book. You want to know why? Because this book addresses the question I just asked you. Why are we here? What do you do before you come here? What is your preparation for your time here? How do you prepare yourself while you're here? What do you do when you leave this place? I mean, these are important questions. So it's not just how to walk into church. It's how to be in church. It's how to, do, to act when you leave church. And it goes through all the chapters of doing those things. And I'm going to tell you right now, the most important reason to be here right now is because you're saying, I want to connect to God with a community of people with the same objective. If you're here because the music's good, your, your motivation's wrong. You're here because the pastor fills me with warm fuzzy. Your motivation's wrong. If you're here because, you know, the kids have something to do and I get some time with my wife and, you know, here's an inspirational message. Your motivation's wrong. If you've come in thinking, like, I'm going to come and get and feed, I'm going to come and receive something, your motivation's wrong. I know this is a really awkward talk, talk, isn't it? But it's important because if Jesus was here, I think he'd ask you the same question. Why, w- did he not stop the disciples often? Why, why are you following me? Did he not press Peter and say to him, I lay it down and people leave me. What are you guys going to do? And Peter says this amazing response. Where else are we to go, Lord? Only you have the words of eternal life. Peter understood he didn't come to Jesus because of free fish, lots of good wine, free healings, miracles galore. 
It wasn't like Jesus was the divine 7-Eleven. I'm just here to serve you. In that way, while Jesus administered physical things, the greatest thing that Jesus gave his disciples was his life. And it was his life that came through these things that were, were meant to fill them with hope and encouragement and joy. Peter understood, we want you, Lord. There's no other no motivation than to know that you're the one who speak the words of eternal life. You are the one who give the words of eternal life. You're the one who embodies the words of eternal life. And so the question is, why are we here today? I know why I'm here. I'm here because I love you, and I love doing something the first day of the week with you that is able to, to glorify God and for us to encourage each other. I look forward to this. Every, this is the first day of the week, and the very first thing we get to do at the first day of the week is be together. Can we just all do one big kumbaya hug right now? <laughs> Why are you here? I hope it's to, to glorify God. I hope it's to, to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope it's to, to hear him share with you the, the course in which you're to live, to, to magnify his name. I hope it's to, to connect with others at a, at a deeper level than just the mere surfacey stuff. I hope you're, you, you come to this place prepared. I hope you didn't come into these doors with the, the thing on your mind being what you saw on Saturday Night Live last night. It's an awful show, show. There was a day when it was good. I hope when you leave here, the first thing on your mind is not like, boy, what restaurant's going to have the shortest line right now? I hope what happens before, during, after has an aim towards God. We have you, and because we have you, we have everything, and there's nothing I want to do more than glorify you. My prayer for you at the end of the service is that you would be more in love with God than when you came in, and that your objective this week is to glorify him in all you say and all you do. That's my prayer for you. 32 years I've been loved by Jesus Christ. 32 years. Multiply that times how many weeks in a year? 52 times 32. Wow, close to 2,000 Sundays I've stepped into church. I wish I could tell you every Sunday there was a pure motivation behind it. But you'd think after 2,000 Sundays, maybe I'd be a little bit more on target. There's hope for us all, you guys. How you walk into here, what you're doing here, when you leave, how you're going to act. This is critical stuff. Who are you truly serving? Is that a fair question? I think it is. How about this question, the second one? What are you pursuing? Look at verse 8. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice, practice kindness, compassion to each brother. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger, the poor. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refuse to pay attention and they turn a stubborn shoulder and stop their ears from hearing. What are you pursuing? The question is this. Is it religion you're after or is it righteousness you're after? Because true religion, according to James chapter 1, is to not only live a life that is unstained by the world, but James says to look out for widows and orphans. Now, isn't this interesting that that's not the only place in the Bible it pops up? It's all throughout the Bible that there are four Groups of vulnerable people all over the world. The four most, most vulnerable groups in the world are the widows, the fatherless, the aliens, and the poor. The poor. Write those down. You need to be aware of this. Especially when it comes to government, when it comes to legislation. We should be going to bat for these people. True religion looks out for the widow, the fatherless, the strangers, the, the aliens in our land, the poor. 
because these are the ones that lack power. They're the ones who are most likely to be oppressed. And so true righteousness, God says, if you truly love him, you're looking out for others because you've been loved, you've been graced, you've been shown mercy by this God on high who now leaves you as his earthly ambassador to make sure people experience the same sort of blessing you've received. If you're after religion, Pastor, I've memorized 500 verses in the Bible. Pastor, I pray three times a day. Pastor, I go to church six days a week. Pastor, this and that. And you have your laundry list of, of the, the checklist of thinking you know what's good and what God ex- God accepts this. He accepts the fact that you who have been transformed by his love through Jesus are now living, transforming your world. You are an agent of his to now go what? Don't oppress the widow. Israel was notorious for taking advantage of the widows, the fatherless, the aliens, the poor. And true religion says this, you have a heart of compassion and you do what you're able to do. And I praise God for people involved in mercy ministries. I praise God that we've had an opportunity as a church community to bless those who do not have power, who do not have a voice, who are, do not have the privilege. We exist for them and as we demonstrate the gospel in such tangible ways you pray for opportunities to proclaim the gospel amen see are you pursuing religion are you pursuing righteousness because true righteousness acts true righteousness blesses others true righteousness changes cultures and as you Walk with this God and develop this organic relationship with Him. You have this awareness of how you can meet needs around you. God's not going to give you this list. He's just going to say, stay connected with me. Allow this to be a living, cultivating type thing. And you're going to have opportunities. Be aware of that. Bless others. Love others. Who are you serving? What are you pursuing? Write down this chapter. I'm not going to read it now just for the sake of time. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 verses 3 through 9. Good stuff. Isaiah speaks the same message to the people and says this. Your righteousness is not bound necessarily to your activity trying to build up your spiritual resume Isaiah says your righteousness is reflected by how well you take care of others, especially the oppressed, the widows, the fatherless, the aliens, the poor. Isaiah 58 verses 3 through 9. Read it, reread it, read it again, and, and I guarantee you probably won't walk away with dry eyes. This is God's heart for people. This is God's heart for the world. I praise God for his rebuking word to me that says, Scott Morgan, when will you start to love others more than you love yourself? When will you stop ignoring the need around you instead of taking care of yourself first and foremost and primarily and start taking care of people that need your help? So the rebuking has to do with serving. The rebuking has to do with pursuing. What am I pursuing? Am I building my kingdom or am I seeking the kingdom of God? Seek first whose kingdom? God's kingdom. And the promise is this. When you put him first, he's priority number one. He'll take care of all other stuff. Third question. Who are you listening to? Because who you listen to, that's who you're being influenced by. That's who's impacting your life. You know, it's one of those studies, you know, you ever heard about those studies where they put kids in a room and they'll play like Mozart for them for an hour and they'll kind of monitor their behavior and then they'll play Metallica for them for an hour and then they'll monitor their behavior. Guess which group is a little more rambunctious and energized? Mozart group or Metallica group? Yeah, because guess what? We're impacted and affected by that which is influencing us. Man, I grew up it, playing in garage bands, uh, heavy metal, hard rock. I had my hair down to here. I looked like a girl. It was a sad day in my life, but God's a God of grace. Amen. But I used to listen to music, and I used to take out my aggression, my driving. I used to take out my aggression in my relationships as a teenager. And I look back and go, gee, I wonder why I acted like this. 
because it was the voices, it was the music, it was the different things influencing me. I'm not saying those things are evil in and of themselves, but what I'm saying is you've got to be careful of the impact it makes on your heart, on your life. Who are you listening to? Look at verse 11. But they refuse to pay attention, God says, through Zechariah. They turn a stubborn shoulder and stop their ears from hearing. So literally, here's the picture. Like God's speaking and they're like, la, 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 la. We can't hear you, God. La, la, la. You ever do that? Isn't that totally immature? What if I, as a 47-year-old man, you were talking to me? I'm like, la, la, la. I don't want to hear you anymore, Tim. La, 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 la. Are you still talking? La, la, la. That's stuff we expect out of a three-year-old. But don't think you're so grown up in the Lord right now, folks. Because the question is, God is speaking. Are you listening? Look at verse 12. And they made their hearts like flint, so they could not hear the law and the words of the Lord, which the, the, the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit to the former prophets. See, isn't it cool that God is sharing with us his heart? He's giving to us his word. The very things that lead to life and godliness. And if we don't listen, pay attention, heed, embrace. If we ignore, we will end up on a path of destruction like Israel was. There's a reason why God destroyed their temple. There's a reason why God destroyed their homes and their businesses. There's a reason why God allowed them to be taken into captivity is because he Faithful as he is, sent prophet after prophet after prophet to share the truth, and they continued to plug their ears and say, no, 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 God, are you still talking? Because we can't hear you. And it's easy for us to sit here and perhaps point the finger and go, boy, aren't they immature. But honestly, when you hear the word of the Lord, what's your response? Especially when God's maybe addressing that very thing that's near and dear to your heart and he's saying, get rid of it, stop doing it, because he knows what's best. What's he saying to you right now in, in, through his truth, through his word that you're ignoring? That's a good question. What is God saying to you right now that you need to act on, but instead of acting on it, you're plugging your ears, acting as if God is silent? Here's what I think I'm thankful for, that God is not silent. There's a place in Minneapolis, and it is the quietest place on earth. It's called an echoic chamber. You walk through three rooms into the center room, the quietest place on earth. It is negative nine decibels. You walk into this room and you cannot hear anything except for the pounding of your own heart, the breathing of, that goes on in your lungs, the, the, um, the, the stomach that's growling maybe because of something you ate or didn't eat. But most people, no one has ever survived more than 45 minutes in utter silence. Because what happens at about 20, 30 minutes in, you start hallucinating because the silence is so deafening that you're thinking you're hearing things and you're not. You're making out things to be something that they're not. And no one has ever survived more than 45 minutes in nine minus nine decibels of silence. What a haunting situation to be in such utter quietness that you go crazy. And yet God is not silent. We can praise him for that. But the question is, he's speaking. Are you listening? Or, or who are you listening to? Are you listening to the, the voices of your past? Because all the voices of your past, all they do is heap shame and guilt upon your life. Tell you you're no good. Tell you that God can't love you. Because, you know, someone in this room is going and saying, I've sinned to this point, and there's no way God can forgive me of that sin. You know that one? But you need to be reminded, there's a great truth in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. It says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. There is nothing you've ever done that's beyond the forgiveness of God. There's nothing that's ever happened to you that's beyond the forgiveness of God or the healing work of God. 
you need to know that God's word is not silent. As a matter of fact, his word is the very word that is set to restore us and rebuild us and make us into the people he has designed us to be. You are not meant to listen to the voices of the world, to be influenced by the voices of this world. They don't want what's best for you. They don't know what's best for you. But there's a God who says to you, I hold the words of life. The very words that are going to promote health and longevity and prosperity and, and joy. Listen to me. Boy, as a parent, I can't tell you how many times I say this to my kids. How many times I say something and they do the exact opposite. So the curse of my mom now passed on to me because I was such a rebellious kid. And, and my wife can testify to this. Just this past week, probably ten times I said, how many times do I have to keep telling you something and yet you don't do it or you do the opposite? And yet I sit there and have to go, well, how, how often does God do that with me? Scott, we're back here again. You got your big boy pants on? You ready to hear it once again? Who are you listening to? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 28 through 31 says, Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look to me, but they will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice, but spurn my rebuke. They will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. See, God said it, that settles it, now act on it. Amen? That's Twitter verse worthy right there. God said it, that settles it, now act on it. And praise God that he's a God who wants us to not only listen, but to heed what he has to say to us. Which then leads us to chapter 8, and I want to address three things in concerning the restoration work of the Lord. Because while he is concerned about who we are and why we do what we do, he oftentimes has to break us down, bring us to nothing in order to build us up into everything he's designed us to be. And there's three things that I think really stand out in chapter 8 of Zechariah. That there's a promise of God to create this culture of, number one, peace. That God has a, a desire to restore this culture of truth. And that he's a God who wants to restore this culture of joy. Peace truth joy look at verse 8 uh, verse 1 chapter 8 so the word of the horse, lord of host came and said thus says the lord of hosts i am exceedingly jealous for zion yes with great wrath i am jealous for her stop right there just circle that verse highlight that verse because what this says is that god is more committed to you than you'd ever imagine god's a fighter and he fights for his people. Is that awesome? Like we think of jealousy in, in negative ways and we get jealous for wrong reasons. But I can tell you right now, I'm jealous of my wife and our marriage, meaning I will fight to make sure nothing inhibits what God wants us to be as husband and wife. I am jealous for her, and the moment something steps in to try to tear me away from her or hurt away from me, I'm going to fight against it because this means the world. So in a positive way, I am jealous for her and I will fight anything that tries to sabotage our relationship. How much more does God do that for his people? He sits there and he recognizes the things that happen in this world that try to interfere with him and us. And he's saying to you, just like he said to Israel some 2,500 years ago, I'm jealous for you. And with great wrath, I'm jealous for you. Meaning when God gets angry at our opponents and our foes and our enemies and anything that tries to rob the joy of fellowship with him, he gets ticked off. How many times do we talk about that attribute of God? The God who's pissed off. Yeah! Because he loves us. He's going to fight for us. And that motivation should, should make our hearts do somersaults. 
that if there's a God who's going to fight for us, and the greatest fight is demonstrated in the cross of Christ, that God took upon himself what he didn't deserve, that we deserved, and he did it for us. Why? Because he wanted to fight for our hearts. And he won the battle, conquered sin, conquered death, conquered the grave, and he did it. Why? Because he loves you. That's motivation for me to say, now I'm going to serve you to the utmost. I'm going I'm to give it all for you, Lord. Because the one thing I don't want you to do, and perhaps what Israel was falling prey to, is that they were, they were serving God but losing heart in their service. You know how you don't lose heart in serving God? You keep in mind what He's done for you. And if you understand the magnitude of the gospel, the death of Christ, you will not grow weary. Keep doing what He wants you to do. And as you're serving Him because of what He's done for you, there will be three cultures that are created. A culture of peace, culture of truth, culture of joy. Notice what it says in verse 3. Then the Lord of hosts says, I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will call the city of truth. The mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. God's presence. And that's peace. Peace is not the absence of difficulties. Peace is not the absence of difficult situations, experiences, circumstances. Peace is not the absence of those things. Peace is the presence of God. If you have God, you have everything. If you have God, you have a defender. You have a shield. You have a strong tower. You have a refuge. If you have God, you've got everything everything you need and he brings peace despite what's going on around you despite what the circumstances may be shouting at you you have him in your midst amen you don't have to go on a religious pilgrimage to jerusalem you don't have to go to to the places where jesus was born or where the temple used to stand the temple has come it is a person his name is jesus and if you have jesus you have peace why because he's the prince of peace he says I dwell with you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. Thus says the Lord, the old men and old women will sit again in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of the age. The streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. This is a scene of peace. Old men, old women, they're available for the younger people to impart wisdom to them. There was this thing called the city gates where anyone of, of, of youthfulness would go and seek the advice of the older people. This is true peaceful community. Now we, we send people off to Sun City and go, li- live on your own. We don't need you. Go shuffleboard your way into eternity. And that's not the biblical model for how we are to treat the aged. We need more city gates. We need more older people saying, I'm available to share what I've learned in life to the younger people so that those younger people don't make mistakes. So there's this, there's this picture of this peaceful community. The, the old men, the old women are out there. Kids running all over the streets. It says they're filled because they don't have anything to worry about. The Lord of hosts says, This is what I want to create. A culture where people are not only connected to the Prince of Peace, but but exuding this peace, living out of this peace. Verse 9, the Lord of hosts says, Let your hands be strong. Strength comes in knowing that God is on your side. Strength comes knowing that your sins have been forgiven. Strength comes... When you know you can persevere because greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. And he's giving you the power to do what he wants you to do. And so there's this scene of peace that is just spelled out. And then verse 14, culture of truth. Just as I purpose to do you harm when your fathers provoke me to wrath, God says, and I've not relented. So again, look at verse 15. I have pur- purpose in these days to do good to you. To the house of Judah, don't fear. Because God is not giving up on his plans. You can never sin your way outside of God's plan for you. God always has your best in mind. But notice the, the kicker here, verse 16. These are the things which you should do. Speak truth to one another. 
judge with truth with one another. Allow there to be judgment that leads to peace at your gates. Let none of you devise evil in your heart against another person. Do not love perjury, for these are what the things I I hate, says the Lord. If there's one thing that ought to embody the people of God, actually two things, write these down. Love and truth. You love like Jesus, and you live out the truth. Because I believe the truth will set you free, and the truth sets others free. Allow your word to be your word, and more importantly, allow your word to be the word of God. What is truth? Truth is God's word. What is truth? It is the spirit of God. We're actually going to talk about this tonight, the Bible. How do we make sense of the Bible? I hope you guys come out at 6 o'clock here tonight. We're going to, you just come with your questions. We're going to have a just informal discussion about all things. The Bible. How do we make sense of the Bible? What about this part? Where, what about translations? What about the history? Blah, blah, blah. We're going to answer those things. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Because I have devoted my life to this. Because this is the truth that God has given to humankind to set us free. But more than set us free, to glorify Him. This directs our lives. And so He's creating this culture of truth but notice this final picture here this culture of joy yeah i love laughing you guys you guys know i love humor i love making fun of myself i love making fun of you it's it's, this is a fun environment because peace and truth leads to a joy that oftentimes is is indescribable is inescapable as you're going to see look at verse 18 the word of the Lord host came to me saying, thus is the Lord host, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth. So now Zechariah comes full circle to what the guys asked about fasting. And here's, the, here's what Zechariah says, you know. All fasting is going to be turned into feasting. All those things you grieve over, maybe you're broken over. Guess what? God is going to turn your mourning into dancing. Isn't that cool? You're crying into laughing because God is a God of joy. Look at verse 20. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will be that peoples will come from all over the world, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants will, of one will go to another saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. So there's a scene of people coming from all over the world to Jerusalem because they know there's something going on there. And what is it that's going on there? Verse 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from all the nations, meaning this complete number of people will come from other nations and they will grasp the garment of a Jew saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Is that not awesome? Like there is something about the joy of the Lord that comes out through our lives as we're living in peace and as we're following the truth that now it it basically shows itself exemplified in this joy and people in our lives are going, tell me what you've got. Tell me why you're responding to difficult circumstances like this. Different than the world. You're, you're, you're trusting something beyond yourself. Your faith is in something beyond yourself. And people are grabbing the garments of the Jew saying, we want to go with you for we know that God is with you. We have a world all around us, ladies and gentlemen, that's desperate for God. And I wonder how many of them are clinging on to our shirts. Because they're saying, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to hold on to your shirt because I have a feeling God's with you. You know something that I am curious about. You know something. And so my question to you is, are we living out the attractiveness of God's love in our lives through peace and through truth? So much so that there's this joy that's now attracting people. Craigslist in Washington State this past week ran multiple ads, different people, specifically men posting ads on Craigslist advertising that they were looking for an experienced dad to grill burgers and hot dogs with them on Father's Day weekend. 
They told a local TV station that they're ready to fill the barbecue dad role, that they're not ready yet. Some men are searching for a dad. So they turned to Craigslist, put an ad out there, basically saying, we need an experienced dad to come grill burgers and hot dogs for us on Father's Day. And I sit there and go, they have to go to Craigslist and put an ad out there for something that Perhaps a neighbor dad can do for them. Perhaps a person that they work with can do them. There's a dad hunger out there, obviously, in Washington State, where there's young men in their 20s out there with their new grill and all their tools, and they don't know what to do. And so they turn to Craigslist saying, we need an experienced dad to show us how to barbecue. And I said, that's one level of hunger that exists in our world. But there's young men desperate for some father figure to speak into their lives. There's some young woman out there desperately seeking for an older woman to speak into their lives. And I'm saying, we as the people of God, if we, if we have peace and we know truth, how are we trying to fill people's lives with the joy of the Lord? Who's calling out for you to be the presence of Christ in their life? You're not asking to make sure they sign the deal for Jesus right then and there on the contract. What God is asking is if you're available to be the light of Christ in someone's life who doesn't have light and who's willing to be the salt in someone's life who just needs to be preserved right now or needs a little bit of taste going on in their experience. Who is God asking you to be the presence of Jesus in their life to? Because when people have to turn to Craigslist because of a hunger for something that we should be ready to provide for them, That kind of community is breaking down, and that's not what God wants. This is his work of restoration. To think about others as more important than ourselves. To think about how we can be the presence of Jesus in this world. God is good. He has shown us his goodness. Now, how are we going to allow these truths to transform our lives when we leave this place today. Perhaps we need to turn to to this. How do we exit church? Tell us, Tony Payne. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Take one thing that God has captured your heart with today and do something about it. Okay? Don't forget it. Because like you, like me, We'll, we'll go, wait, what did I just hear 30 minutes ago? But what's the one thing that God is challenging you with this morning? And run with it. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, forgive us for being a forgetful people. I'm going to be honest, it's, it's not just forgetfulness, it's just, it's just an obstinate heart. We love our idols too much, and yet you've come to break down those, those false gods in our lives to show us the freedom and the beauty of just being wholly yielded to the Lord. I pray for all people here today who might be struggling in an area of their life where they have a hard time submitting to you, really obeying what you would have for them. And my prayer, Father, is that your your strength and your power would rise up within that individual so that they would have the strength to overcome these, these obstacles. And they would just experience the delight of obeying you and honoring you in their lives. Lord, for all of us to live for your glory. For all of us to live lives that reflect the, the, the magnificence of the gospel that has set us free. For all of us to walk in the love and the truth that has so enraptured our hearts. 
Lord, for there not to be any desire in us that's selfish, but for every desire to be fully from you, God. Maybe that's a perfection that, that I don't understand. Maybe that's a, that's a desire that is just cannot be met. I don't know, Father, but meet us where we're at and change us and transform us for your glory and our good. Thank you for today, for allowing us to sing, for allowing us to look at the word, for us to be yielded to your spirit. May your will be perfected in us. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you're interested in being baptized, that's baptized, not baptized. Like some people, we're going to meet right over here. If you're just curious, you have questions, we're going to meet over here. Have a great Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon. <laughs>